Anybody know what this is? By the way, welcome back, Mad Modelers. Welcome back to Grant's shop. No, that is not a Bossel model airplane. That's a squirrel. That's a dog. Dog doesn't chase this squirrel because the dog is smarter than the human. The human is the one chasing the squirrel. Yeah, I'm off on a side project. A tweener in the men's middle of a tweener. All right, this model here is a Gillows Cessna 170 that I had built probably 25 or 30 years ago. I just barely took off the little Cox PWO 20 that was on here and mounted this E-Flight 2500 KV. I think it's a, I can't remember the other stats on it, but anyway, um, just barely mounted it on there so that I can get an idea of the weight and balance and where I'm going to put the battery. So far, the battery is going to have to go right up front. No big deal. But we are going to build one purposely built for electric. And we're going to, I'm going to show you guys how to put this kind of finish on it and how I'm going to do this. Okay, the fuselage so far has been built as per plan. There's going to be some modifications though. This, these braces in between these bulkheads are removed. There's going to be a big piece of this that's removed to resemble this because we're going to use two dowels up front for the wing and one nylon bolt to hold the wing down. Uh, the receiver we're going to use on this is a Spectrum. It's got the AS3X gyro on board, so it should make a really nice light, lightweight stable airplane to fly uh i make mistakes so that you don't have to one advice would be to cut these lightning holes in the bulkheads if you can before you assemble it do your internal work before you put on all these stringers this is like trying to build a ship in a bottle yes i've done one of those no i will not do it again at this point, the firewall has been added, and there's been a piece of 16th inch sheet placed across these two side keel parts for added strength and to help with the battery box. Radio gear has now been installed with hot glue so that you can get it out. I'm not comfortable with the mounting holes that are there because quite a few of them are right close to some very uh, sensitive parts um, exposed solder joints and whatnot you don't really don't want to ground those out so that's why i chose hot glue the uh stringers you can see have been cut out here and here this side piece is going to be filled in with a piece of 16th inch balsa wood that's going to be glued to the fuselage where the rest from this stringer and in between here is going to be removed to form the battery hatch the two side pieces are put in now, 16th inch. This will be overlaid with some 32nd inch balsa wood because there's areas of this airplane that are going to be planked completely. The top of this will be planked completely and clear back to about this bulkhead. And then wherever it's round, I only want to see open in the flat spots of the fuselage. That way we don't get that typical faceted look of a string and tissue airplane so now that these two pieces are on that center keel piece can be removed because now it's stiff enough we can go ahead and do that okay the hatch has been roughed in and you can see that there's a dowel that has been through drilled through this firewall material that came in the kit and a big hole routed out for the battery to come forward i don't know what this stuff is made out of but when you put a Dremel to it, it smells like puke. Honest to God, it made me wretch. All right, for clarification purposes, my bulkheads B4 and B3 are cut clear down to here. And then this area right here is where I put the beams in for the receiver. I found a picture on the internet of a Cessna 170 dash that I was able to shrink down to fit. What do you think? Okay, flaps and ailerons. 
this is a Fowler type flap. Now, this tab here is for hinging purposes. So, ow, that's a sharp pin. Um, usually a Fowler flap will go back as it drops. So, come on, hinge, there we go. You see how it drops back and that way it keeps the flow of air across the top pretty much even, but this air coming up from underneath is high pressure and it ducks the air up through this area and adds flow which increases lift. So we can do something like that. Problem is the Cessna has tracks that the flap works on. What we're going to have to do is put a hinge about here. Let me get this to work. You know, this one-handed thing is bullshit. Anyway, we put the hinge there, it will still rotate and still keep a nice curve, but we won't get as much flow up through the bottom, which I don't think is a problem, really. And actually, you know, I, I would need to work on the geometry so that this works a little better. Okay, but that's the flap. If we, if we want to, we can hinge it down here, but the hinge is going to be exterior to the wing, and it's not going to be scale. All right. On an aileron, when you increase the curve of the wing, you increase lift. But when you increase lift, you also increase drag, which induces what's called a Dutch roll on the airplane. So the aileron that comes down ends up getting draggy, and it usually that's the wing that goes up, and it wants to go backwards. So, to compensate that, the Spitfire uses something like this, and so does, well, the Spitfire is really pronounced, but the Cessna has it hinged up here, so that on the opposite wing, when the aileron comes up, it has this lip that sticks down that produces drag, so that when the one on the other side goes down to increase lift, it, it kind of balances out. As far as your fuselage build is concerned, these stringers can get in the way when it comes to putting these control rods in and connecting them to the receiver. However, if you want to do it the way I did it, I slipped the control rods and receiver and everything in from the front through this hole. So all I did was drop it down in with the rods in place, slipped them through the holes, and then hot glued the receiver in place. Fuselage is now planked except for the flat areas that I want to lay open just to save a little bit of weight. And now it's time to move on to tail surfaces. What I've done here is I've framed it up. You notice that these pieces are missing for now. It's because I don't intend to use them. What I intend to do, there's the rudder that I'm not even going to use at all. This is the rudder that I will use. It's a piece of Depron foam that I have glued to a balsa stick. The original frame, let's see if I can get it to focus, is in there, but it's been skinned with some 32nd inch balsa along with the vertical fin. Now the vertical fin will be sanded down and monocoated with chrome monocoat. This is going to be covered in a little different way. This is 5 thou thick aluminum foil available from Amazon. It's a K&S. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe some lines in that with a piece of square stock to maybe simulate the, the, uh, the ribs that are on the rudder. And this is going to happen to all of the control surfaces on this plane. By laying it on some Depron foam and using that piece of uh, square brass stock, you can see what it does. The effect is going to be magnificent. Okay, to uh, create that effect, I have a piece of 5 thou aluminum foil from k &S. Now, I've drawn a pencil line down the leading edge where I don't want these marks to go, and I'm using a spacer. This is a 1 8 inch wide. Uh, let's make sure I'm, I'm going to have it somewhat uh, straight down the road here. 
So let's make our first pencil mark. Make sure it's at a right angle. Now I'm going to take my straight edge and my gauge. I'm going to take a really small standard bladed screwdriver. I'm going to start right there where my mark is and just draw it along. And I'm going to do it here on this side too. There, we got our first two marks. Now I'm going to continue all the way down this way and then I'll pick up this way and go that way. This is really, really tedious work. But when it's done, it really is a showstopper. Yeah, that one didn't go deep enough. There we go. We use our piece of square tubing as a gauge reference on how far to space them. Now this can also be done with the aluminum duct tape. That's how I did my first Cessna 170 Gillows model. And it worked out okay. Um, it wasn't as pronounced as this. This is a little stiffer and it works a little better, but the aluminum duct tape can work very well too. And I'm going to be using that duct tape to go around the cowling because this whole airplane I want it to look like polished aluminum. Oh by the way this stuff can be very sharp. It's only five thousandths of an inch thick. Well I got a bit of a problem on that one. I may have to scrap this piece and do another one. See what happened? So it is somewhat visible there. Well, I may have to just uh, keep going and cut around that. Yeah, I'm looking to do both elevator halves. That would have been one half of an elevator. This would have been the other half, but I guess I'm going to have to redo it. It's all right. We'll redo it. Doesn't matter. I mean, the wine is sour. Throw it out. Anybody tell me where that came from? You got to be a Charlton Heston fan. Charlton Heston, Rex Harrison, and the movie is. All right. That's the backside. There's the front. What do you think? I think it looks great. All right, the corrugated pieces are epoxied onto some Depron foam. It's been glued to a backbone here, balsa wood, that's for hinging purposes. And it's been traced from the original part. So all I need to do now is sand this to the edge that goes right straight down the middle and then I can epoxy that onto here. All right, here's where this build gets a little bit tricky. We're gonna do a scale type flap on it at this tiny scale. We're gonna hinge it here so that as the flap move, well, up here, so as the flap moves down, we still have a nice curve up here and it hopefully will let some air in through the bottom. Um, on the real Cessna, it had a track so that it moved out and down, but we're not going to mess with any track. So, in order to get this shape in here, I'm going to use a piece of 64th inch ply here and a piece of triangle, well, let's see, triangle stock right about here, but we've got to file or sand a curve in here. Best way to do that is to use a dowel with some sandpaper on it, glue the 64th inch ply on it. This has got some double-sided tape so it doesn't move around on me. 
and then start sanding to get that desired shape. And I want to keep it up towards the ply where it's going to be up towards here. And I'm not worried about here. That'll get sanded after it's been mounted in the wing. So this is, this is where this little project is going to get pretty tricky. All right, you see that the wing is now framed up, roughly framed up. The leading edge from this stringer forward will be covered with 164 inch thick plywood. That's to give it a nice smooth curve and maybe eliminate some stall problems. The uh, flap area, you can see, has been rounded to both sides so that we can put our hinges in and get it to drop and act more like the full-size aircraft. Same thing with the aileron. The aileron is kind of a freeze style aileron where it, when it drops, it cups up underneath there. But when it comes out, there's a little piece of lead edge that sticks out and creates a little bit of drag to help compensate for the drag on the opposite wing. Because whenever you add lift, like an aileron going down, it creates lift, but it also creates drag. So it wants to pull that wing backwards. Well, by doing it this way, and the guy that in, uh, designed the Spitfire knew that, to balance those control surfaces, he's got that leading edge that drops down into the slipstream and helps create some drag to balance both sides. So that's next. We're going to start building some flaps and some ailerons and the other wing. The wing tip, I am not doing per plan. I'm going to use some uh, soft balsa, and I'm going to carve a tip out the way it should be. CA hinges have been put in place. Uh, a little bit of the balsa wood has been carved out, so these are inset. Uh, the hinge usually looks like this, and it's been cut way down because you don't need that big of a hinge in there. We're going to be using some really small servos too, so we don't need to put a whole lot of bind on them. Um, this will be covered over with this 64th inch strip to encapsulate the hinge. Servo has been installed by adding a little stringer here to support it and the main spar is cut out. I'm not worried about this being a weak spot because there will be a piece of 64th inch thick ply that will go across this area that will transfer the stress through it. Not only that, but you've got these two pieces of 64th inch ply and the top sheeting. So there will not be a weak spot in this wing. Now you want to test these servos before you mount them in place to make sure that when you tilt the receiver or the plane in the correct direction with the gyro on there, that they move in the correct direction. Planking. All right, I've got this piece of 64th inch thick ply already secured on this edge with some uh, thin CA. This piece of paper towel is wet with water. That's all I use is water. Some people like ammonia mixed with water. Some people like alcohol, window cleaner, whatever. I just use water. And I'll do it on the balsa like I did here. You notice how nice and tight it wrapped around there and didn't split. Because I let it soak on the one side that I want to expand. So just let it soak, and then after a while, it will lay down easy, and then you can just zip some super glue in there, and it's done. Wing halves have been joined, joined by this piece of 64th inch thick plywood. Uh, this gives it me a little bit of time to work with it on the inside. Servos have been mounted. The whole thing has been plywooded, sanded and basically ready for covering on the bottom because that's what I'm going to have to do is cover the bottom and then add the flap hinges afterwards. This is all reinforcement because the 64th inch ply is kind of thin, but this area here will reinforce for the wing bolts. The little connector on there will plug into another connector in the fuselage when you put the wing on. So you'll put the wing on this way, which I have not drilled for the dowels yet, and then move the rear end forward and push it down. Yeah, just push it down, and it will connect 
with the mating connector on the inside. This way you don't have to mess with those little teeny JST connectors plugging them into the receiver before you mount the wing. It's all one shot. The little corner square blocks were added because of the wing bolts. The connection between the two elevator halves is by a carbon fiber rod. You gotta groove this part to accept the rod. I have not done that yet with this one. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take an X-Acto knife and I'm gonna cut a V groove in there and then later on, I'll take a dowel or something the same size with a piece of sandpaper in it, and I will hog that out and make it a round groove. Then this can be glued onto this on a flat surface, and now you have both elevator halves connected. At this point, we're going to make sure that, that wing is totally lined up, and then we're going to drill for the, the uh, dowels. So go through both at once. We'll make a great alignment. Now I'm going to stick a part of the dowel where I just drilled so that the next one will line up also. And there we go. Now all I need to do is cut the dowel a little bit shorter, stick it in there and glue it in. Wing bolt blocks have been added. This is 1 8 inch plywood backed up with some triangular stock and then epoxied in place behind it. The holes were drilled with the number 36 drill and you go through the wing, the blocks and everything in one shot just the way you did with the front dowel location pins. Now these holes will be enlarged these will be chased with a 632 tap 